Okay, hi. Um, my name is Kelly and I am English by origin. I'm currently living in France, um, just outside of Paris. And I used to live in Japan. I've lived in a few countries myself. And um, so I'm kind of a lifelong expat. Um, I stopped living in England when I was about 22. So um, there's some subjects in this presentation um, that are dear to me because I am an expat and using uh, translation is a big part of my life. So I work for Hiero Solution. Um, you can see our nice big logo here. And we are a network of translators and interpreters that specialize in certified translation. So if you don't know what that is, you'll find out loads more about it soon. Um, so I'll just start to, oh, we've got a little note. Hello from Moscow, wow. Um, I don't know what countries you're all from. If any of you are expats, go ahead to put in the countries you're from. It could be in interesting to know how many people we have and what countries they're from. I'm sure that all of you have had some experience with translation. I'll start, um, to, to talk a little bit, but feel free to make any comments in the chat and maybe we can uh, have a little conversation afterwards and see if there's anything that we need to talk about, any questions. Oh, we've got loads of people from different countries, that's awesome. So, um, translation is a part of all of our lives from birth and we're used to seeing content in our own language. And that's especially true when you are an Anglophone. Um, so I can see here, we've got a lot of people that are not Anglophones, I'm an Anglophone, and yes, we're a little bit known for this. We're used to seeing everything in English, um, English movies, a lot of the dominant uh, movies that are in English, the American movie industry. And this is why Squid Game, I don't know if you guys have all watched Squid Game, but that was a massive breakthrough because we're now watching movies in Korean, we're watching movies in Japanese, Chinese. Um, obviously it started to become much more international on Netflix. Um, so we don't really think a lot about all the translation that's going on behind the scenes, um, but translation is happening all the time and we just don't think about it. We don't really give enough respect or love to the people that are translating all of our content because there is a lot of people behind the scenes and they are translating everything for us. So um, there's some examples here. There's some examples of more kind of um, normal everyday translation. So like the stickers on your food packaging. I don't know about you guys, but I buy a lot of food from Japan. As I said, I used to live in Japan. Well, they translate all that food packaging into French because they have to by law. So when I buy my food pack, my Japanese food in Paris, it's translated into French. Um, when you buy your safety notice with your TV, your Ikea furniture, Netflix, as we mentioned, social media, um, books, uh, shopping websites, everything is translated way more than we imagine. Um, every, there's a lot of translation going on behind the scenes. And if you are um, traveling, especially if you are immigrating, and this is where it comes back around to me being an expat, um, we have my birth certificate, passport, diplomas, wedding certificate, visa application, um, these are the sort of things that you might need a certified translator for. So for anybody that isn't aware, I think I actually have a definition on the next slide. Here we go. A certified translation, which you sometimes call a sworn translation. Um, it's the process where somebody who is qualified to do so translates the document and signs it and says, OK, this is accurate. Because, say for example, my, as I mentioned, I'm English, I'm living in French, I could translate my birth certificate, I'm pretty sure it'll be good, but I'm not really qualified to do that, they can't trust me. So in France and many other countries, um, they will not accept my birth certificate in English unless I've paid a sworn translator, a certified translator, that the French court has decided they trust and has given this approval. And then the French translator has the permission to um, sign it off and they'll accept it. So to give you examples from my life, um, I actually had to do some sworn translation. I was looking to um, make an official kind of registry wedding in the in the office, you know, not, not the big church one, a, a more practical wedding. And I had to translate everything, my birth certificate, 
um, a few other documents. So it's something that is happening um, very regularly. If you need to make a visa application, say for example as well, as I mentioned, we work in translation. Um, I'm in the middle of arranging for a translation at the moment for somebody's pay slips. They're, you know, they're, that confirms how much they're paid because they're applying for a visa and the visa application, they need to prove they have money, they have a good salary. So even though it's their payslip, it's mainly just numbers. They, they need that translated and it needs to be certified because it's an official document. And so this is kind of what it is. I mean, it's a certified translation wouldn't usually be a safety notice or your Netflix uh, subtitles. It would be more official bureaucratic bureaucratic documents. We're doing administration. It's a little bit, um, it's not the most fun side of the world, but it's definitely one of the very important ones. We're going to see how now. So we've decided to tell you a story about a guy called Michael, who is going to do a lot of traveling. Now, he actually reminds me there's a lot of people I know from my expat life, and I'm sure that you guys will know some people as well that have lived in five different countries. They have parents that are different nationalities. Actually, my own grandmother is Japanese. I don't look it at all. I look very English, but my grandmother's Japanese. Um, and everybody has these mixed families now. And then they study in one country. They decide to get their first job in another country. They get married, they're having kids. I mean, this international life, has started to just become the norm. And I have a lot of friends that have lives like Michael. I know a lot of people like Michael. So he's kind of inspired by a mixture of all the people that we might have known. So his mother is German and his father is South African. And he studied in Germany till the age of 20. So that's been, that's where he's grown up, you know. And then he's turned into a handsome young man here. He's gonna go for his international studies. So he's decided he's done really well with his studies. Apparently he's gonna to go to Stanford University in the USA. So after um, reviewing his admission file, the Standard Uni uh, University has approved it. And they said that he can go there for two years, which is great. And there's actually something in the Stanford University logo here, um, which I'm assuming is actually German. I don't actually know. <laughs> and it's the air of freedom blows. And we don't realize, but a lot of um, little bits of foreign text are hidden everywhere. So in order to study abroad and complete his application, he has to arrange for a number of documents to be translated and certified. And there we go. So it's just highlighting that little bit of text there. So he has to translate a few of his documents here and then he's going to be able to go and study. Um, okay, so he's got his documents translated, he's, he's graduated already, and he's going to carry on into his life, he's going to start to do something else. Um, he's actually managed to find his first job in New York City. So I don't know if any of you have ever done a visa process especially for a country like the USA. Um, I had some experience working in the USA and I promise you they are very difficult. They're not very friendly sometimes. They're very, very great country, but they are very serious about who they let into the country. Um, they're very serious about the documents. They're very serious about everything. So when you apply for a USA visa, you definitely have to show, um, again, the, the salary that you might have to prove you have enough funds to support yourself at your stay in the USA. Um, there's many other documents that you might need to provide. So his first job, um, after achieving his student visa, um, he needs to now convert his student visa because his first visa there for his studies um, it, it isn't good enough for your, for your working, you need to change it. And it's a personal story, but I actually had a problem. I didn't have the correct visa one time and I was actually ejected from the USA. I can now go back because I have done the correct process and it was an honest mistake, but I didn't have the correct working visa and I actually was not allowed to enter. They stopped me at the border. They looked at my visa. They asked me what I was doing in the USA. I told them, they said, you can't come in. And so the student visa here does not work. 
we're going to have to go to the, the working visa and he's going to have to do some translations again. Because one thing about certified translation is that often um, you're actually not allowed to use one from one year ago. Even if one year ago you had your birth certificate translated and it's certified, that often runs out within like three to six months. They want you to do it again. So um, he's going to propose his file for his contract, which is renewable. So he'll probably get like a one year visa. Um, I know this is how it works in France. I'm not actually an expert on USA working visas, but I've got a lot of friends in France. You apply for your one year visa because you have a one year work contract. And when that ends, you have to apply again. And I have a lot of friends constantly applying for new visas. By the time they receive it, they have to start the process of application again. Um, France is also a really fun country to try and get visas in. It depends on your nationality. I always had an easier time um, before Brexit. I have a little bit more difficulty now. So um, he's doing a working permit and then a second one because they're going to but prolong this contract one time so he ends up with two contracts and he's doing all the paperwork again um so at the end of his working life in the usa what happens next to michael our fictional character who is adventuring around um his company has proposed him a new challenge he's gonna go have the possibility to work at the company's headquarters and that is based in Tokyo. And it was actually my idea to put Tokyo in. Again, I lived in Tokyo myself. It's an amazing country, highly recommend. Um, but one of the problems with countries like Tokyo, like Japan, um, is that the whole writing system is completely different from um, our Western writing system, from you know the, the Roman text. So, um, translation is even harder because it's even Google Translate is completely useless. Absolutely, completely useless. I absolutely promise you, you cannot use Google Translate. It's not working very well. Um, so it's off to Tokyo and he's going to do a visa application. Again, definitely need one of these. Um, I've done a visa application before for Japan. And again, they're going to want um, some information about your work, information about who you are, etc. cetera, um, depending on the language of your documents. So one thing that I've always had to, because I am English, a lot of countries do accept English or their language, like English or Japanese, because English is a, an international language. However, say, for example, Russian documents, 100%. Um, I've got friends that are doing um, Italian and things. Um, hang on, I've got a, a comment here. Yes, Google. I've got some really funny stories about Google Translate where I've used it for personal reasons. Um, I actually went to a really big exposition recently about tech. And we were talking about um, AI. So everybody at this, this tech conference, they're loving AI and things. And we were talking about why even Google, who has the best resources, I mean, it's Google, right? If they cannot make a translating robot, um, it will even depel, you know, it's better. But even for me, if Google cannot make a good translating tool for, that is AI, then um, I think it's just a sign. I mean, we definitely need humans. The human input, exactly. Well, for me, a human needs to know the nuance and the difference in all of the expressions, like jokes. And a robot can't understand jokes. It can't understand your tone. It can't understand the delicacy of language. So this is one of the reasons um, why human translators are always going to be completely necessary. Robots cannot understand the emotion, the intention, and um, persuasion. There's many, many amazing things about language um, that Google's never going to be able to do. Um, but I mean, I, to be honest, DeepL is a better translator than Google. That is very true. Um, but again, uh, we are always going to be needed. So I'm not a translator myself. I'm actually, um, as I said, an expat and I'm very passionate about languages. I speak bad French and bad Japanese. Um, but my CEO, the lady behind Hiero, she's actually a translator herself. And she made this... Um, she made this 
um, company to help translators with a lot of the problems she saw herself. And one of them being that due to things like Google Translate, people aren't concentrating enough on the importance of human translators. They've started to see it as something that maybe robots could do one day. So anyway, we're off track a little bit about Google Translate. I'm gonna carry on a bit about Michael. So we're gonna go off to Tokyo. Here he is. The last step before going to work in Tokyo, again, his birth certificate is German. And he is going to tr translate his Google, uh, his birth certificate, he's going to do his American diplomas, because they might want his Stanford uh, degree, they might want that translated. And there's, there's all sorts of translation and dossiers going on, paperwork. Now they want his CV in Japanese. So I don't know, um, I'm sure everybody's written a CV before. They have quite a standard format, and you can see an example here. Um, this is quite a standard format. It's a bit of a visual one. Mine's always a little bit more of a Word document, but you know this kind of, this format, it's the basic. This is one thing, it's not only just a case of translating language. A lot of the time, translators are bridging a cultural gap because it's not just a case of making English to French or English to Japanese, it's the cultural gap. And that cultural gap is apparent here when we go to see the formatting difference. So the Japanese CV um, is actually really, really strictly formatted and it's a lot more, ABC, you have no creative input. I mean, a lot of people nowadays are having these more creative um, kind of CVs with pictures and all sorts. The, the Japanese version will be regimented, you know? And so somebody who is used to the American version won't be very confident putting it into this version. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to, sorry, I was just reading the comments there. Um, so he's going to go to his new job and he's going to do his file. He's going to find his translator. And then what's going to happen next? Um, he decides to start his new job. And with that, he started his new, he's found a new apartment. And he decides to get a Japanese driving license. So again, um, I actually know a lot of expats and this, this is just literally constantly life. I mean, all my friends have been through a lot of things to have driving licenses, to do many things. So he's getting his driving license. Um, and again, he'll have to do a lot of paperwork. This is one thing people don't talk about when we're talking um, about uh, expat life. I think a lot of people, especially my friends stuck back in England, they say, wow, you live in Paris, that's awesome. They don't realize that when I live in Paris, I have to do French paperwork and it is awful. Same living in Japan, Japanese paperwork. It's not as fun as you think. So Michael's got some big news. He's found himself a girlfriend. So Paloma was born in Buenos Aires and she studied in Argentina. She's also, you know, this kind of international profile. She's done a lot of traveling and she's decided to move to Tokyo as well based on her um, degrees and everything. Her career's taking her there. So Again, you can see, I mean, I actually know a lot of couples that have this kind of situation and it seems a little bit, um, but this is really, it's what's happening nowadays. You have two very international people that have international lives. They meet in expat Facebook groups and things and they start dating. Um, they decided to buy a bigger accommodation together in Tokyo. So exactly, exactly academics. Um, I, I'm not ex myself an academic, but I have many academic friends. And so they are um, buying a bigger apartment together in Tokyo. Now that contract's gonna be in Japanese. We actually helped somebody recently buy an apartment in French. They were an English speaker. So again, they're gonna have a translator, an interpreter to help them buy this apartment. And we'll just go, you know, briefly, because I could go into so much detail about how much translation and help they might need in this process, even if they're actually pretty good at Japanese, they're going to want a translator and an interpreter during this process. I mean, really, you're buying an apartment, it's not, um, it's a legal contract, it's not a, it's not, you know, it's not a game, <laughs> it's a very, very serious matter. Um, so, um, 
Oh yeah, read the comments. Seriously, even with two European, yeah, exactly. Do you know what? I'm happy that you say this because I have a lot of Anglophone friends being English myself and they have never moved abroad. So they've never had to do this. And if I tell people that haven't traveled a lot and haven't married internationally, the, the things that people have to go through, they'll be like, no, it can't be that complicated. It really is. And people, you know, I'm glad that you, I'm glad that you've experienced it and that you can understand our story here. So um, they've, they've had some kids. This is nice. They've had Joshua and Catalina. They've had two children. Um, and we're going to see what happens next. Again, we're just highlighting how much this international life, there's just so much con translation to do i mean it's 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 more than you think and especially as well the languages here german spanish then we're we're living in japan now and yeah i mean it's a lot of paperwork again i'm i'm so glad that people are agreeing with me in the comments the paperwork for living abroad is horrible and the thing is too i mean i've cried i've properly cried just because of the frustration because i'm not speaking my language i'm feeling alone my mom isn't here and i'm trying to do paperwork paperwork um i lost my phone recently i was trying to file a police report for the insurance um it was i cried i actually did cry so um this is why people like translators interpreters they are part of our life when we're in this situation um so we're just recapping here after all the things that he's done he's needed to do his german he's needed to do his uh american english we're gonna say english because i'm english but yeah his american english uh documents japanese documents and and then so maybe they're kind of missing um europe they've decided to go get married in france so this could be a destination wedding so actually i read a fact the other day um a lot of americans elope to france and i didn't realize this but there's a lot of people coming to france just to get married then they're going back home maybe they're moving to france Let's assume they're moving to France. I used to, um, I actually, I've been, I've had the experience before of helping somebody ship a container of all their possessions back to another country when they're expatriating. Again, for the customs, you need a list of everything in your shipping container, and that will need to be translated because the customs people in Japan will want to know what is in your shipping container. It might be guns or something so you need to say what's in your shipping container and when you get to France they're going to tax you on everything in your shipping container so again it's going to be translated so um yeah that's very true um there's definitely a lot of going to Hawaii um and I think as well do you know what in um in England I think we're more Mexico and I'll tell you I mean with an ex-boyfriend a very long time ago, I looked into this process. Obviously, we did not get married. And they actually need a blood sample in Mexico. If you want to elope to Mexico and get married, and um, they would need a blood sample. And I don't, I didn't, I didn't hundred percent understand why. But I mean, aside from translation, which obviously they want your birth certificates and things like that. Um, I actually did read, I don't know if it's still the case, I'm talking like 10 years ago. I read you have to give a blood sample to go get married in Mexico. So a lot of people are coming to France. Maybe they're starting a new life here, or maybe they're just going to get married and go home. Either way, definitely translation. And um, the documents you're going to put in are going to need to be translated and definitely certified if it's in France. Um, the French, they have the system. It's like the translation Asamonte. And again, it's um, somebody that is sworn to the court. And there's a list that you can get from the court in your area of who is certified. And then you can go contact one of those. Um, it can be a bit of a difficult process. Exactly, the traduction Asamonte. So being a French company, we specialize a little bit, especially in the, the French, but all over the world, we specialize in the, um, the certified translation. Um, so, the question is, and this is a little bit, um, nowadays we have Google, you know, as, as we've, we've mentioned, we have Google. It's not always very perfect. So um, how did Michael find all the certified translation uh, translators? Um, 
John was the first translator in Michael's life. And that's this, uh, the guy that was doing his German certificates for his university admission file. So he's great. He loved John. John was very helpful. But when he needed to then start translating Japanese and American into Japanese and all this kind of thing, you know, throughout, and then maybe they need some Spanish and they need many other things. John can't help. Um, John is the first, um, John is the first uh, link in this chain. So if he didn't go to the USA to study, then all this wouldn't have happened. And I suppose for you, for you guys, I'm not sure who is a traveler who is studying abroad from, from our, our guests here, but um, I suppose in a way as well, the first country I went to live in was Japan. And if I didn't take the step to go traveling and to leave England, I would never be in France now. I mean, it's about take, taking the, the step, you know? Um, it's about doing it and it's about filling in the paperwork. Um, so we're going kind of a little bit to a translators network online. And this is what we've actually created at Hiero. Um, we have a network. And if you don't know how to find a certified translator, again, going back to France, you have to contact the court usually and they have a list. Um, or you can kind of Google, but again, I mean, you're usually Googling in French. I know it's not my favorite thing to do. So we actually have a network of translators. And if you need any language at all, then you can come to our network of translators and we can help find somebody. And that is where in this kind of lifestyle, oh, I clicked that on too early, but we'll skip. So in this kind of lifestyle, there's all these kind of languages needed. Um, a network is exactly what we need. And the strengths of an international translators network, I don't know how many people watching our translators themselves, but we're actually trying to create a very social experience. As I said, our CEO is a translator herself. And um, we're actually trying to make a kind of community where you can be known in your community, locally and abroad, um, and to connect and to discuss, to share maybe like your ideas, your professional um, processes and things. We're trying to make a community. And so that's one of the benefits of having a translator network um, throughout an international life. So um, in our network, we have people like Michael that are coming to us. Um, as I said, we help people recently buy an apartment in France. I'm helping somebody at the moment with a translation um, from Spanish for an American visa application. Um, so we're helping people all over the world. And for our translators, um, they're not having to look for their, their missions. We're sending them straight over. And because they're dealing with people internationally, Payments can be a bit of an issue that's secure um, through our platform. And um, there's a lot of help. Um, so actually, um, this, this presentation was made by my colleague who isn't a native English. And I spell checked it and I have obviously made a mistake because that comfort there, that's my fault. I apologize. Um, it's spelled with an M, comfort. Um, I apologize for that. So it was me that spell checked it. So I, it's not my fault of my colleague who made this presentation. So um, the compatibility in the layout, as we mentioned before, you it's a cultural thing sometimes. It's not just a case of style. Um, the compatibility in the layout is sometimes a cultural thing. So I'd like to thank you all because um, I don't know if I spoke too fast or if I wasn't very clear in some points, but I think to sum up, basically um, we have very international lives now and we need translators more than we think. Even Google, we forget Google. We, Google is not very helpful in most situations. We need translators and um, we just wanna thank you and oh, uh, do you know what that was the uh this is this is a little bit of information about the company i work for i think um oh thank you there's some there's some compliments in the in the comments i appreciate it a lot so i think we actually have permission to go oh so we're allowed to go to a different link now if you want and we're allowed to continue to discuss so if you have any questions for me then please come ahead, go ahead come you know feel free to come ahead we've got 30 minutes in this separate chat so I'm going to go into this separate chat now. 
I don't know if you've got my name, but you can add me in LinkedIn. You can find me and send me an email, however you want. But don't hesitate to find me on LinkedIn or join our chat now. Thank you all very much for attending and I hope you have a lovely day. Thank you. Have a lovely day.